you're looking at an image of Sharbat Tagula, who is also known as the Afghan girl, an adolescent living in a refugee camp in Pakistan during the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. This photo was featured on the cover of the June 1985 edition of the National Geographic and came to be known as the most recognized photo in the history of the magazine. A number of factors probably contribute to this fascination we have with the photo, not the least of which are the subject's eyes. There has always been a preoccupation with the aesthetic nature of eyes, but today we're going to look at the structure of the eye itself, as well as the compartment that encases it. In this session, on the eye and orbit. Good day and welcome to today's discussion of the human eye in orbit. The eye itself is a complex organ which is critical to our ability to take in and process our external environment. Just as complex is the collection of muscles responsible for precision movement of the eye into a multitude of positions. Now in this first segment of our discussion of the orbit and eye, we'll focus on the eye itself and its supporting structures, including the bones that make up the orbit. We'll also briefly discuss the lacrimal apparatus responsible for the production of tears and how they work to moisten the surface of the eye. The orbit itself is a hollow cavity within the skull found bilaterally inferior to the anterior cranial fossa and lateral to the nasal cavity. It has a conical shape with the apex directed posteriorly, opening into the middle cranial fossa and the base open anteriorly. The medial walls are directed more or less parallel to one another, while the lateral walls diverge at roughly 90 degree angles to each other. In doing the math, we see that the orbital axes, running from the apex to the center of the base, must be at approximately 45 degrees to one another. This is different from the axis of gaze, which in a neutral eye position is directed along the anteroposterior axis. As a result, the orbital axis is directed 23 degrees lateral relative to the axis of gaze. As we'll see a little later on, this has major implications for muscle function, where the line of pull is along the orbital axis. The medial orbital wall is composed of the maxillary bone anteriorly and the ethmoid bone posteriorly, with the lacrimal bone sandwiched between. The sphenoid bone also contributes to the most posterior aspect of the medial wall. The medial wall is thin and weak in particular along the ethmoid bone due to the presence of the ethmoidal air cells. Within the medial wall is the lacrimal groove or fossa which houses the lacrimal sac with implications in tear drainage. The medial wall is also the attachment point of the trochlea which as we'll see a little later on alters the line of pull for the superior oblique muscle. The lateral wall is made up of the zygomatic bone anteriorly and sphenoid bone posteriorly. This is the strongest portion of the orbit, as it needs to resist mechanical trauma to the side of the face. The orbital floor separates the orbit from the maxillary sinus and is formed by the maxilla, zygomatic, and palatine bones. The floor is separated from the lateral wall by the inferior orbital fissure. The roof of the orbit lies mostly in the horizontal plane and is formed by the frontal bone anteriorly along with the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone posteriorly. On the lateral surface of the roof is the fossa that houses the lacrimal gland for tear production. The apex is found posteriorly within the orbit and is composed primarily of the sphenoid bone along with the palatine bone. Both the optic canal which allows passage of the optic nerve and the superior orbital fissure, which accommodates the oculomotor, trochlear, abducens, and ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, are located at the apex. In addition to bony protection, the eye is supported in the orbit by a number of soft tissue structures. First is the periorbital periosteum that lines the bone tissue itself. The base of the orbit is supported by the eyelids, which are composed of dense connective tissue plates lined with skin externally and an internal mucosal lining called the conjunctiva. The connective tissue plates are called tarsi, 
which provide mechanical protection from abrasion to the surface of the eye when the lids are shut. Deep to the tarsi are tarsal glands, which produce a lipid secretion that coats the margins of the eyelids to produce a watertight seal when the lids are closed. The margin is also the location of the eyelashes, which help to deflect away airborne particulate and small insects when the eyes blink. The remainder of the anterior margin of the orbit is taken up by a thinner connective tissue layer called the orbital septum. The septum thickens both medially and laterally into palpebral ligaments, which serve as anchoring points for the eyelids. Most of the contents of the orbit are encased in a fascial sheath that extends backwards from the base of the conjunctiva to the external surface of the optic nerve. The contents within this fascial sheath are encased within a particularly dense mass of adipose tissue referred to as retrobulbar fat. At their anchoring point to the conjunctiva, the sheaths form what are called check ligaments, which limit the movements of the eye within a physiological limit. Despite its exposure to the dry atmosphere, the external surface of the eye must be kept moist. This is accomplished in part through a constant aqueous solution produced by the lacrimal glands, located in the suprolateral margin of the orbit. This solution is secreted through a number of ducts directly onto the suprolateral surface of the eye. Although quite subtle, the upper eyelid is pulled medially during a normal blinking motion which helps to sweep the fluid secretions from lateral to medial along the surface of the eye. Ultimately, these secretions collect at the medial angle, where they drain through superior and inferior punctum into the lacrimal canaliculi. The superior and inferior canaliculi fuse to form the nasolacrimal duct, which drains into the nasal cavity in the inferior meatus. This will be discussed in a separate lecture. Tear production is typically imperceptible, but an ongoing process. Too little tear production will result in dry and irritated eyes. Of course, there can also be an overproduction of lacrimal fluid, as seen when the eye is irritated or a person is overcome with emotion. At these times, there is too much volume to flow normally into the punctum, and the overflow streams down the face as tears. Drainage into the nasal cavity also increases, which is why crying results in the person experiencing a runny nose. Time for a brief overview of the anatomy of the eye itself. The external surface is lined with bulbar conjunctiva, a thin mucous membrane that is a continuation of the palpebral conjunctiva along the inner surface of the eyelid. Deep to the conjunctiva, the outer wall of the eye is composed of three distinct layers. The outermost layer is the fibrous layer. Posteriorly, the fibrous layer is composed of an opaque connective tissue known as the sclera. This opaque appearance is what is being referred to when people discuss the whites of someone's eyes. Anteriorly, the fibrous layer is completely translucent, allowing light to enter the inner chamber of the eye. This is the cornea of the eye. Deep to the fibrous layer is the vascular layer, where the majority of blood vessels providing nourishment to the eye are located. The choroid is the posterior portion of the vascular layer. Anteriorly, the choroid is continuous with the ring-shaped ciliary body, which is made up of circularly oriented smooth muscle fibers. The ciliary body is thoroughly attached along the periphery of the lens, with cords radiating out from the margin of the lens. When viewing objects at a distance, the muscle is relaxed, which increases the diameter of the ciliary body, and through the action of the attached cords, pulls on and increases the diameter of the lens. This results in narrowing of the lens, which allows the light from distant objects to converge on the retina, bringing the distant object into focus. When viewing objects that are closer to us, the ciliary body contracts, decreasing the diameter of the ciliary body. Again, this decreases the diameter of the lens and increases its thickness, allowing these light beams to converge on the retina. Changes in the overall shape of the eye over time or in the elasticity of the lens may make it increasingly difficult to stretch the lens sufficiently to see faraway objects which is a condition known as hyperopia. 
Similar changes may make it difficult for the lens to bulge sufficiently to see near objects in focus, a condition known as myopia. Corrective lenses can assist with either of these two conditions. The lens itself is made up of carefully aligned protein fibers that, similar to the outer cornea, are translucent to the transmission of light. In certain disease conditions, these proteins can clump together, resulting in increased opacity and cataract formation. Risk factors include normal aging, alcohol and tobacco use, diabetes, and excessive exposure to sunlight. Further anterior still, the ciliary body is continuous with the iris that is responsible for the various colors of a person's eye. The iris is similar to the ciliary body in that it forms a circular ring. In this case, however, the central portion is a hollow aperture, forming what is perceived as the pupil externally. Another difference is that the iris is formed from both an outer ring of radiating smooth muscle fibers that are under sympathetic control and an inner ring of circular fibers that are under parasympathetic control. With bright lighting, the parasympathetics stimulate the inner circular layer to contract, decreasing the diameter of the aperture, similar to what is seen with the ciliary body. This results in pupillary constriction. In low light conditions, the circular muscle relaxes and sympathetic stimulation causes the radiating layer to contract, resulting in pupillary dilation. The retina forms the innermost layer of the wall and is formed by photosensitive cells that detect photons of light and send this information back to the brain through neural tracts located in the optic nerve. Along the back wall, the cells making up the retina spread to either side like the parting in a person's hair or long grass that has been pressed down. This is the focal point of the retina, known as the macula. Spreading the cells here prevent diffraction of the light photons, allowing for maximal resolution. The portion of the retina that surrounds the macula is responsible for peripheral vision. As the retina is thicker in this region, because the cells are not pressed down, peripheral vision is inherently more blurry when compared to focused vision. Another important region along the posterior wall is the optic disc. This represents the convergence point of all the optic tracts returning to the brain. As a result, the disc is found deep to the attachment point of the optic nerve along the back of the eye. Because of the high volume of axonal tracts passing through the circular region, there are no actual photon receptors at this point along the retina. As a result, the optic nerve is a blind spot void of visual information. You can verify this yourself by placing a dot on a piece of white paper and moving the paper in front of one eye with the other eye covered. At some point, the dot disappears, representing the angle at which the light photons strike the optic disc. That's going to do it for this discussion of the eye and its supporting structures. In the next segment, we'll look at the muscles of the orbit and the complex pattern of muscle contractions involved in generating muscular movements. We'll see you then.